In the third presentation on linear systems, we are going to discuss the question when a real, real world system can be treated as a linear system and model with linear system models. So, when can we treat a real system as, mod uh, as a linear system? Well, we can immediately say that a system is approximately linear when the amplitudes are small enough. And approximately means, of course, that there are no perfectly linear real systems. All real systems contain some non-linearities, but the question is then when we can approximate them as linear without doing too large errors. And as I say here, that is can be done when the amplitudes, when the oscillation amplitudes are small enough. And what does this small enough mean then? How can we interpret, how can we interpret this? Well, first of all, the, the, the amplitudes must be so small that the material properties are, can be described with Hooke's law. They should be linear elastic, so no plastic deformation is allowed. So linear elastic material properties is a must. Secondly, the kinematic relations must be linear. And um, as an example on what we mean here is, for instance, this pendulum. Now, <clears throat> the pendulum equation where the theta, the angle theta, is the variable uh, reads like this and as you can see it contains a sinus theta term and this is a non-linear term in theta but if theta is small small amplitude theta here then we can use the Maclaurin expansion of theta and use only the first term which is theta itself and in this case with small theta amplitudes, the governing equation will become a linear differential equation. And the same holds for other types of vibrating systems. For instance, if we have a bending beam, well, a beam that is vibrating and bending, if the amplitude, bending amplitude, is too high, then the normal Euler uh, Bernoulli equation cannot be used. It must be replaced with a nonlinear bending wave equa equation. And in that case, we cannot use a linear system model. So, in all situations where the amplitudes, the oscillation amplitudes, are small enough so small that we have linear elastic material properties and that we have linear kinematic relations. These situations we can use linear system models. <clears throat> um, and what is meant then with small enough? That is of course decided by the situation. How large error can we allow when we use the linear model? So, in the end, it's, the, it's an engineering decision to make. How large errors can we allow? This is um, an example then from a, a well-known Swedish car company, Volvo. In the 80s, late 80s, they used the linear system model of their car, of the acoustic property of the car. You can see here on this side we have the inputs, the excitations, the sources, and that is as shown here various forces, uh, wheel road forces, forces from the drive line to the car body, and so on. And then they used a uh, <coughs> uh, matrix of frequency response functions, Y. To describe the path then from the exciting forces to vibrations in the cabin, the car cabin. 
here are the variation velocities. And then, in order to um, sort of end up in uh, sound pressures at the driver's position and the passenger positions, they used the second uh, frequency response function <coughs> matrix to describe the path from vibration velocities to sound pressures. We will see in a later presentation how you can combine um, um, frequency response functions from two different systems like this to unify in one single system like this. So this uh, is an example then from a real life complicated, very complicated system, how you can use a linear system model to describe the path from exciting forces to, in the end, sound pressures in the cabin. A simpler example, but nevertheless a very useful example, is shown by this example here. Suppose we have a water pump, maybe electrical driven, it could be the cooling pump in a car for instance, and suppose this pump now causes strong vibrations in the frame that supports the pump. So if, suppose now that we can reduce the amplitude of the contact forces between the pump and its frame. Look, suppose we can um, reduce the force amplitudes with say 50%, that is the half of the original value. How is then the frame vibration uh, affected by this reduction. Of course it's reduced because it would be very strange if a reduction of the excitation would cause an increase in the um, response. But how much is it reduced? Well, since if we assume then that the um, frame vibrations is linearly related to the exciting pump frame contact force. And this assumption is, well, um, if we consider the earlier discussions, this uh, assumption is valid if the pump and frame vibrations is small enough. So if we use this assumption, then we can state that, okay, the frame vibrations at a particular frequency f is proportional to the contact force at the same frequency. And the um, uh, proportionality constant is the frequency response function. And what we say here in the task is that we somehow can reduce the amplitude of the contact forces, that is this, with 50% of its original value. And if that is not, if the frequency response function is not affected by this reduction, then of course the responding velocity, vibration velocity, will also be reduced with 50% from its original value. So, a change in the source will be uh, will create a response that is uh, changed in a proportional manner to the excitation. That is what we have earlier called the principle of homogeneity, which holds for a linear system.